So Toby and oh, I okay, are we're here. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna do something. Hello. We we uh, we're missing a third person that uh, that we don't know has gone AWOL. So we're going to to do what we can on the fly. Um, you had a topic you wanted to discuss, and I wanted to hear about it. Did I? No, I didn't. Yeah. No, no, that was just a. Pre well, I mean, I have some topics here to bring right. out, but they probably aren't as good as yours. Oh, I. Yeah. Uh, that may be so. Nevertheless, I would like to yes. hear your topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. What's Thanks. the first topic? Um, so the, the first one was, this is very much brought up by the fact that uh, here in the UK, we have obviously now the highest death toll in Europe, which was predicted weeks ago. And our government went, no, that's ridiculous. It won't be that. And, yeah. and now it is. And at our, we have a daily briefing that takes place at seven o'clock every night where uh, scientific advisors are there alongside whichever poor politician has been wheeled out to do it. And every night they've been showing um, y uh, multiple charts. And one of the charts was comparing the UK death toll with other places around the world. So, you know, France, Germany, the US as well, and all that stuff. And yesterday, when our death toll shot up, not because of new deaths, but because we were factoring in previous deaths that we've now realized were corona linked, they stopped showing the chart. They just didn't have it. And when a reporter said, why isn't the chart there? The scientists, one of our chief scientific advisors said, um, we're taking it down until we can factor in all the different variables, which may not happen until after the crisis has passed. So let me understand. And you suddenly they're suggesting mm -hmm. that it's not accurate because there should be maybe more people counted or they're being uh, well no i think what they're what they're suggesting in a very british way is everyone else has counted wrong and that's why we have a much higher number it's mm. because other countries are massaging their figures to look lower so therefore we aren't going to post our figures anymore until uh, comparatively i mean they still tell you what the overall death toll is they still tell you what the daily death toll Right. All that so stuff. Like, so like but they're thing. not going to show you a chart. Yeah. So this is but like com stupid competitive, little... competitive COVID. It's like, yeah, you know, the, yeah exactly. We are, we are, uh, yeah. You, so in fact, the, uh, hmm. your curve but, here, though, so looks the, the, pretty, you know, it doesn't. The curve looks like everywhere it's else. Not... It's just it was much higher because we didn't go into lockdown for 12 days later than everyone else because we're idiots who thought that, um, that herd immunity was going to be a thing. So it, it was something on that line about science can be made to lie. Right? Because this is a scientist who knows what she's doing. She knows that she's doing what the government wanted, which is hide from your casual viewer who might just tune into that nightly thing and not read any other news sources. Hide the fact that we are now way worse than anywhere else in Europe. But it's a scientist doing this. Mm -hmm. And what we like to think is that science is so above all of this fray mm -hmm. that the scientists should be going. Well, I personally would continue posting these things. I've been asked not to. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. actually, it turns out that scientists will do kind of what they're told. Mm. Um, so science is flawed is basically the thing I wanted to get at. And I was trying to get before that into that science has become our new superstition, that a lot of people mm -hmm. don't understand it, but they just wave their hands and go, science will fix it. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's by throwing money at it, or maybe that's by, I don't know, creating a bunch of doctors in that field all of a sudden. But nobody understands what the true nature of research is, and that science isn't this wonder thing where you fling enough money at it and it just does it, but it's entirely interconnected with multiple different fields of research, multiple different um, types of institutions, and it has to be seen holistically. So, I That is making me think of um, something that I'm just gonna pull up here. Okay. And that is, um, that is this concept of post-normal science. 
Um, I have heard it mentioned in interviews. I didn't really know what it meant. And it's sort of, there's a whole kind of think school of thought, I guess, developing here. And to try to understand it, I was reading this article, which I thought was interesting. And it said basically that, um, uh, it says that it's, it's no longer feasible for ruling elites to employ experts for persuading the public that their policies are beneficial, correct, inevitable, and safe. Um, so they're suggesting that this new approach, which they're calling uh, post-normal science, is a science right. for when situations, when facts are uncertain, stakes are high, values in dispute, and decisions urgent. So that's a mouthful, but it's an interesting uh, kind of concept. So if I, I have started to read about this and um, I don't necessarily really understand it fully, but I think the idea is that rather than have these sort of ivory tower elites decide mm -hmm. for you, you know, really what should be done, it's saying, why don't we canvas a larger group of people the more the, the better from different domains who can come together and sort of give us kind of blow by blow, you know, more yeah. democratic decision making to deal with this very fluid situation. And um, one way of looking at it was this chart here that says post normal science is good when you're dealing with very high uncertainty and very high stakes. So, so it sort of breaks down how other different fields of science deal with different areas. So applied science is something where the mechanisms are very well understood, the domain is very well understood, and so therefore listening to you know, a leading scientist or something in that field is very appropriate because they know precisely mm -hmm. what to do. Then you have the sort of consultancy science, which is sort of in the middle where it's middling amounts of uncertainty and, and, and stakes are a little higher, but not, you know, not, not the end of the world doomsday scenario. And then you have pandemics, which are in the post-normal science category where you want to, um, you know, get as many people as possible mm -hmm. involved in, in that, this fluid process. So I, I just, I just like the word post-normal as well, because it seems like so many people are, are post-normaling things, you know, we're in a post, a post-normal society or we're in a new normal. And <laughs> I just thought that that was also a very interesting it's, something, it's also very interesting how we always refer to things as post when in fact usually post something is pre something else yes exactly well postmodern is i mean are we really postmodern i mean it doesn't aren't we contemporary at all times <laughs> or modern at mm -hmm. all times <laughs> so yeah exactly. so 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 that actually steals the thunder a little bit on one of my topics what i was going to have for our third, <laughs> our the, the third person okay. And, all right, um, all right. Well, we'll do, but let's leave it, and then we'll do that because I've got others. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll save that one because that I want to bring this conversation up if we finally get that character on the line because this okay. I think feeds into that nicely. But I, I I like what you're saying about about um you know using the authority of science to give yourself um. You know the authority to make decisions false. when yes false when, authority yeah. when you know it, it could be an emperor's new well but it, but and, well. and if you liken it well exactly but if you also liken it to hey the gods have favored me uh, i am the mouthpiece of the gods mm -hmm. it's now we follow the science right mm -hmm. i am but a mouthpiece of what the science is telling me to say and it's the same kind of delphic utterances that you're getting um Except now a politician says, well, this is what it means. And then the scientist usually goes, well, no, we didn't quite mean that. But it is, it is as though science is becoming this mystical thing. Well, well, here we have like a situation our, like, where, where there are people in positions of science leadership, some who speak the truth to power as it were, and others who don't, who are just cronies for the power. Mm -hmm. So, so I think in this particular moment, we have a, a situation where, and forgive me if I'm getting this wrong, anybody who's watching this, mm -hmm. but my perception is that Fauci, Dr. Fauci here, is someone that people tend to believe is trying to get the truth out, and that 
Burks, who is kind of closer to the administration, is someone who is just towing the party line and and not telling it right. like it is. And they're both sort of in the so, science uh, authority hot seat, but one is you know kind of a crony toady, and the other one. So is what a, makes it? What makes a scientist do that? Mm -hmm. What makes a science political? There's political science. Yes. <laughs> it's true. But why, what makes a scientist, in a sense, compromise themselves? Mm -hmm. This well, actually it could be a whole bunch of things. I mean, science is political. It's worth looking at the work of Thomas Kuhn. Maybe some mm. of it seems a bit dated now, but he liked to look at how science and how revolutions in science are not sort of, they don't occur in the way that we think because science has this sort of idea of this sort of rational approach to, you know, testing hypotheses and whatnot. And all of that is true, mm -hmm. but science revolutions tend to come in ways that, that um, are a little different. People are attracted to hypotheses and things that just sound better. And that, that has to do with cultural phenomenons as well. So it's, uh, I think his, his work is kind of interesting in this context, but there's an, okay. a, there's a different people taking authority. I mean, rather than the Pope, maybe now it's, uh, you know, uh, some leading infectious science um, uh, thought Bono. or something. <laughs> but I, I thought of a premise that might be interesting in this context. And that is, Hey, he's the, I'm, in a quiz last week. I found out he's the only person who's won um, an Oscar, uh, an Emmy, uh, a Tony uh, and a uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Wow, that is pretty mm. impressive. And he still mm. hasn't found what he's looking for. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I brought in this premise that I thought might be apropos, which is God created the world, but it's the devil that keeps it going. Lies, superstitions, political motives. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, there's another. There's another phenomenon that that uh, that this reminds me of, which is um, um, I'm going to call it hero worship, um, because we have this kind of weird situation. It strikes me where, you know, we are we are support we are applauding what the first line defense people are doing mm -hmm. and it is you know it is admirable but it's especially admirable given that they are knowingly putting themselves in harm's way not because this virus is so so deadly but because they just don't have the protection right i mean the the protection right. is a, is something that could be easily resolved, but was not easily was not dealt with. So you have a situation where, if it was, if it had been dealt with, people would have gone in the front line. They would have had all the protection, and then they would have you know people would just take the chances that they had. And and but you'd feel the sort of confidence that that sort of safety net that we could put in place is in place, and everything that we could do is done. Mm -hmm. um, instead, we have created a situation where we knowingly have almost created the worst situation possible and then said, oh, you must step in and be like the sacrificial lamb in the situation. And then as a public, we, we applaud this and put people on pedestals and say, this is wonderful. You know, look at what these people are doing. But they're mm -hmm. actually put in a really morally um, unsound situation because you know, they are largely very empathic, caring, motivated people that have ch chosen a profession that, you know, has its risks. Um, mm. and so they want to do their best for patients and help people. But at the same time, they know that they are putting themselves in a situation where they are likely to die. And so is the, every member of their family or other people they come in contact with, not because... Mm well for for you know something that was avoidable right so it's it strikes me as a bit morally bankrupt in some ways because to to cheer them on is obviously something that we'd all like to do because we feel a bit impotent and we know that they're doing something you know heroic 
But at the same time, mm-hmm. it seems to me it's very ironic and quite disturbing because, you know, collectively we have created a situation that is very harmful for them. Um, and so, you know, part of me well, feels worse like... Than that, the, the, yeah. yeah. No, but I'm worse than that. Actually, it's 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 at least here the government is now taking credit for Thursday night applause, and so you're going out and you're kind of it's now an officially government sanctioned thing. So I did wish to show no support for this government at all because I think it has led us down to every single turn, and now it's become politicized. Yes, they they've hijacked that that good feeling so and made it. I, I don't to want to go out and applaud. I mean, I do want to go out and applaud, but I don't want to go out and applaud. But now it's also become a thing where if you don't go out and applaud, your neighbors notice that you weren't there, and they'll just casually say, "Oh, you weren't out there uh, on mm. Thursday night." So it's this, and it's, you suddenly realize it's it's this it's the societal pressure now where we're like prairie dogs, and once a week we pop up and we look around mm. and then pop back down again. To me, it's like a, a lot of moral compromising because, mm. because like, like you're describing, yes. you're saying you, you want to. So, so I don't want people to misconstrue what I'm saying. I do think that the individuals that are doing this are very admirable people. Um, yes. But what I don't like is how it's been wrapped in this sort of heroic, um, kind of nationalistic you know, go team go, when in reality, yes. all of us have created a situation that is putting them in extreme harm that didn't, that could have been avoided. That That's my thought. And the other thought that comes to mind is that if all of us would just stay at home, right, they, people wouldn't be showing up in the emergency ward, right? And they wouldn't have to be there. So mm-hmm. I, I feel almost in a way that if, if, if some of these workers were to go on strike and just say, look, you know, we're going to stay home, as should you. And if we all stay home, there won't be a problem. We won't have to be on the front lines. And we'll just do that until there's enough PPE and stuff. And then we will go back when we have, you know, a certain level of security or not a certain level. Let's just say a ra- reasonable level of security that anybody would expect, right? And and this this problem is not just the first defenders, as it were, in the in the um, the hospitals. I mean, that's the place where it, it creates the kind of the most sort of moral compromise friction uh, in, in terms of, oh, I want to support them and all this and that. I want to say it's heroic, but isn't it kind of awful? The other places it's happening is in nursing homes, obviously, where there's hotspots. But the other one I find interesting is the meatpacking one. And this may not be an issue so much in Britain, but in the U.S., you have a situation where mm-hmm. meatpacking and process, meat processing plants are, have become incredibly infectious, where the workers are becoming terrified, but they go to work because they, they are, they're living on such subsistence employment that they need this job and they have to make this money. And it's very low paying and very hard, long hours. And so they're going to these places that are infecting them at, at huge rates. And when they ask or try to push the companies to increase the safety measures, the companies just went to the government and the government forced a mandate through that said you had to stay open. Oh, and by the way, you'll be free of any liability if you put people in danger. So that is the weirdest kind of conglomeration of moral compromise in this that mm. just takes what's happening with frontline health workers to another degree where it's yes. really... You know, saying to people, well, we don't, you know, we don't care if you, you know, if you're in danger or you have to work because you're, you're going to be evicted if you don't pay the rent or whatever, you got to work for us and Mm -hmm. die for us, you know? And so that's why I've been really feeling like herd immunity is what the, what the elites are encouraging the rest of society to do for them mm. so they can emerge later safe and sound, right? So they're basically saying, yes. why don't all of you go out there and um, work for us and open the economy again so that when it's, and, and get sick and die and get herd immunity so that when it's safe for us, we'll come out. And it reminds me of cannon fodder mm-hmm. for and trench warfare in the First World War, where it's like, let's send wave and wave of kind of young soldier and then the generals you know will emerge yeah. later when it's all safe 
So um, to me, this is pretty awful. And it's forcing us to ask all these, you know, questions about, um, you know, I'm going to say the sacrificial lamb, but I'm putting the word sacrifice because we're, we're trying to, we're trying to put a heroic paint, put a heroic um, spin on this, right? By saying, look at right. what all these people are doing. Aren't human beings wonderful and this and that, but that's ignoring the fact that this was an avoidable situation. And this type of heroism is being pushed in the countries where the situation is the worst, right? I, I mean, I haven't heard the South Koreans or the Taiwanese going on about heroism and all that. Instead, it just seems mm. like they just got on with things and did a really good job of containing and managing the virus. Whereas in these places, you know, like Italy and England and the U.S., where it's been terrible, there mm. you hear these stories of these heroic people, you know, putting themselves on the front line and isn't this wonderful? And it's like we're kind of keying, you know, ginning ourselves up for something when we should actually say, wait a second, we've created this awful situation and everyone should just stay home and, and figure this out before we throw each other, you know, throw people under the bus or in the front lines of harm, you know. So. Right. That was a mouthful, but that's kind of what I've been no, no, feeling that's... watching the news. And that's the new normal. <laughs> you know, this is the new normal. The new normal is, you know, sacrificial lamb, cannon fodder, herd immunity, and lots and lots of moral compromise. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, and, at least pan uh, pandem pandemics don't lie. <laughs> and I'm going to also, on us. I'm also going to put in this, this reminder. This is a good premise. Penny wise, pound foolish. Because that is what many of much of the Western mm. world has been. Um, in the U.S. Mm. here, um, we are we've put several trillion dollars into a uh, emergency relief package. Apparently, there's about seven trillion more of loans that are hiding behind that for for businesses, and we're talking Jeez. about another okay. three trillion dollar package now. So all told, wow. I think it it will easily be a $10 trillion or more bailout for this economy. Um, very so for easily. Us, it's 500, for us, it's about 500 billion, I believe. And um, of course, the reason we left Europe supposedly was it cost 13 billion a year. So go figure that one out. Oh. Well, I'm going to say that before all this happened, on the sort of progressive side of the uh, partisan divide, there were a lot of conversations about, you know, single payer health systems and about, you know, mm. ways to provide more public services. And of course, the, 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 con the, the criticism is always, well, how are you going to pay for it? Well, we're about to dump $10 trillion in a bailout and a bailout that isn't necessarily going to result in any improvement to our infrastructure or our systems or anything. It's just simply no. money to tide people over to get through this lockdown. So it's it's just like throwing that money down the toilet almost. I mean, I mean, okay, it's just treading it's, water. I mean, if that money really went to individuals, right, and giving them paycheck protection or mm. something, okay, fine. That that I think would be very meaningful because it meant that you could hold everything in stasis and wait it out, and no one would lose their jobs, mm. and everyone would be sort of just sort of in a holding pattern. But instead, we've just like cratered everything, and then said, "Oh God, let's throw ten trillion dollars at it." you know, and, and try to kind of band-aid the situation or something. And it's, that's Pennywise pound foolish. That's why, you know, we, we try to have these discussions and remind ourselves of historical events and things to say, what can we learn, you know, here? And why can't, why can't we stop ourselves from doing this again and again? And I think storytelling mm. is often cautionary tales, right? It's saying, let's, let's try to mm. um, remember the stories of the past bring them up to date, make them relevant for now, because we need to, we need to remember things. Um, we need to remember that in our past, we have done very radical, we've had very similar things happen and we've had various mm. different outcomes as people responded to them very differently. And why don't we try to take some of the best and jettison some of the worst and actually improve our response to these things or our preparedness 
<laughs> our preparedness to these things. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, I, I guess going back to kind of like, you know, uh, the story side of things, I have to say, even though I've talked about how yucky all of the situation can make me feel, there is the sardonic part of me that finds the whole sort of, you know, um, uh, commercial sacrifice, you know, rather interesting. And I'm going to call it a commercial sacrifice because it's basically for commerce, for uh, the benefit of, you know, corporations and the economy and various other things that we have, we're asked to make, um, to sacrifice our lives. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering, you know, if you, if you made an advertisement for that, you know, what would the ad look like? Um, I, 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 I love these. Well, I shouldn't say I love, that's the wrong word. I am fascinated by the advertisements here in the U S for medications. Um, mm. I feel as if we should watch some of them in a future jam because there's this incongruous imagery and narrative where they'll show you all this positive imagery of people having a great life and enjoying their family and friends. And then the, narr the narrator will read this off this extensive list of, of complications and dangers from using the medication. And <laughs> the juxtaposition of these two things I think are so bizarre. And I think you get somewhat inured to that after a while, because it, it keeps coming on TV and you keep sort of zoning out mm -hmm. that it sort of trains you to sort of look past that, right? You're sort of looking at the imagery and it's, oh, it's all these wonderful things. And you, you start to ignore this voice that's telling you that, you know, all the horrible ways you can die from this medication. And, right. <laughs> and I find myself never getting used to it. I, 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 every time they come on, I'm just horrified <laughs> by it, <laughs> but it's, but it's, but it's also, you know, deliciously horrible. It's a, mm. it's a, it's like a, a, a farce, you know, some kind of death farce, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm gonna have to have the the death farce. Yeah, you're gonna uh, have to put that in there. Yeah. Um, I'm actually gonna see if I can find uh, uh, uh. It's a new genre. It is. It's like there, there is. You're right. There's actually this genre of ads here. Um, that that um, I'm gonna see if I can find one quickly, because there was one I just saw. On television, that um, no, okay, I'm gonna have to look it up and find it later. But it was, um, <laughs> it was. I mean, they're they're all horrible and and, and egregious in various ways. Anyway, I can't find it. There was one that I saw mm -hmm. um, the other day that I just was gobsmacked by it. <laughs> so just watching it, going, "Are you kidding me?" Um, yeah. Anyway, um, death farce. So uh, there we have our genre. Great, <laughs> done. <laughs> so this, so this situation right now is a death farce. I guess that's what I'm kind of suggesting. And w what do you have in a farce, right? You have, um, you have things like, um, you have like- Communications. Missed uh, appointments, missed deadlines. You have swap. You swap uh, identities. You have miscommunications. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Secrets, obviously, lies being mm -hmm. found out. Um, speed is the is the vital thing for it. Uh huh. You that's can't right. do. You can't have a slow farce. Yes, that's actually. It's funny you say that because. I'm I'm a huge fan of farce, and when you get mm. slow farce, it just yeah it just doesn't work. It just kills it. You have to have mm. that. So so it's the sort of the you know what I I would call it. It's like a um, uh, it's like a fast spiral 
out of control, right? That That sounds exactly like today. Yeah. That's why I say we're, we're in the middle of a death farce. And, and so we have all this sort of irony all around us. Like, you know, the medical workers like, yeah, guys go, you know, and, and then you've got, um, the, the meat packing and the food processing people who are, you know, dying on the front lines. And it's like, open up the states, get them working again, you know? And then you have mm. an administration that is telling people to lick, to, to drink liquid Drano. I mean, they're, they're, they're saying drink Clorox or inject, <laughs> inject Clorox, you know? And I mean, it's, it's like, a, no, uh, no, that was satire. He was, that was satire. That's American satire. And, and Boris, you know, I saw him, I saw him, you know, uh, on the TV the other day and I thought, you know, goodness me, man, I know that, you know, the messy hair is your sort of shtick, but I mean, can you just run a comb through that once in your life? You know, does it, is this, is this part of your branding? It's like Boris has this branding now, you know, and this sort of befuddled mm-hmm. kind of, you know, fly by the seat of his trousers sort of, um, yep. you know, public school. And we love that. You know. We um, love that. We love amateurs. We loved Eddie the Eagle. And I would say that Boris Johnson is the Eddie the Eagle of prime ministers. <laughs> um, if anyone doesn't know who Eddie the Eagle is, how would you describe <laughs> how would you describe him? Because it's really oh, oh I mean he was he was he was a completely amateurish uh, British ski jumper who trained himself. He sent himself to the Olympics because we, of course, don't have a ski jumping team. So it was very easy to qualify as number one in the UK. And he became a hero because he, I mean, he didn't win anything. I I think he came last, but um, he became a hero briefly because that's what we love here. Our amateurs done (laughs) good-ish, but if they do too well, then we don't like them. Okay. Oh, he became the British ski but, jumping you know, record holder, the ninth in amateur speed skiing. So that's not too bad. Yeah, uh, and, and he he has a film. He had a film out. Yeah. And he wrote an autobiography. I mean, you yeah. know, you can you can get a career out of being a British failure at something. So so yeah so so um so that's let's see what who who has made besides Eddie the Eagle a career out of epic fails. I guess that would be our president and your prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right yes i know this is going to upset people that love the president and the prime minister and i'm i'm so sorry to kind of do, rile do you, you all think up are, but, who, are they do they listen to this really <laughs> well i want I it to be so. i want it to be an open uh place for lots of ideas to collide of course so, so right. there's nothing yes, wrong with that i mean actually i i would like to have more conversations with reasonable reasonable people that support those those um leaders because you know i think i think that would be interesting (laughs) well i what i usually find is people that 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 know part of the story so they usually like the leader because there's the there's the part that they like that they hear about but then there's all the other stuff Mm -hmm. they they're not really aware of and and when you yeah. bring it no, up, but they the, feel but like the you're is, attacking is, them or something, yeah. you know, which is which is not well. Good. Exactly, and this is the problem: is that it now feels like a personal attack. So there's a friend of mine who voted for Brexit, and any time you mention anything, even remotely connected, and by that I mean criticizing a newspaper, one of our right wing newspapers, daily newspapers that supports it, they'll leap to its defense, hmm. and so everything has become political, everything, and therefore everything causes offense. And Over here, this is, is called not identity politics. You. Yeah, the, the idea is that I identify sure. with this politician or this movement or this policy or whatever it may be, and therefore, if right. you no, attack it, that, you criticize then, it, you attack but me. Now, but, but you're not even you're not even criticizing that thing. You're criticizing a thing that supports it. That's not even the thing itself. Now they can that allows them to take personal offense. This is the extraordinary thing. Brexiteers here are unbelievably defensive, considering they've won. <laughs> um how where have i heard that before <laughs> you know someone over here keeps attack. going on about how they want the election they won the election it's like we know yeah. we yeah. know this is the no. this is our fate now it's not like we this we're is, under any kind exactly. of it's, illusion it's, about so it, you know? why are you being defensive about people going hey maybe it's well, not as good I'm as very su- i'm very surprised to hear that happening in britain simply because what one one thing that's always struck me between the Britain and the U.S. is that the Britain's been very into debate. They love debate, 
and they there's a sort of the, they like the rules of debate and following it through to its conclusion whereas here any form of debate mm. that criticizes an idea is an attack on the person so so it, so debate is more like shouty matches it's not really a thoughtful it's, and it's uh, true. critical yeah. reasoning you know it's it's but, just but I, th but I think it's kind of becoming like that here because again it's a, it's a nice shortcut of a way of getting stuff to be interesting that wasn't interesting before politics was very very dull before hmm. now it's prime time viewing now it's ooh this sells newspapers ooh this gets clicks on websites ooh so i think there's this weird feeding thing that goes into it which pushes these parties to extremes in order for them to maximize exposure and the media want that because they want fighting they want yelling they want people getting upset because that's great sound bites. That's great well, little clips I, you can then subsequently put up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put at the heart of this the death farce because this, <laughs> Jesus, is, this, is, this is our how death farce, how many, right? How many trees do we get through? Um, sorry, we got uh, we got hmm. lots of things going on here, but but this is a this is a cluster. Talking about clusters and outbreaks, we have a we have a post normal science. Sorry, that's not part of that. We have a new normal cluster. That's all this moral compromise, cannon fodder, sacrificial lambs towards herd immunity. This, so I'm just, I'm just bringing out the death farce. Then we have sort of like what makes a good farce. So this is sort of like the, the, the elements that need to be in this death farce, which we have in abundance. Mm. We have the secrets, the lies, the fast spiraling out of control, the swapping of identities and miscommunication. And then... Mm -hmm. We, we applaud that. That's like we, we're, you know, there, well, not everybody, but there are a lot of people that really say, yeah, you know, our leaders are like Eddie the Eagle. They're just sort of flying by the seat of their trousers. And isn't that awesome? And, and that right. leads to sort of um, epic fail. Um, this commercial sacrifice, I think, actually belongs over here. So the new normal is the, the commercial sacrifice. And the, 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 the outcome of all this is the penny wise pound foolish. This is the message, the kind of, I'm gonna try using this one for now, but we could come up with others, but I like this sort of God created the world, but this devil that keeps it going because that's why it's a death farce. It's like we, the people who are in control are the ones that keep it going <laughs> um, with all this nonsense. Um, so let's see, epi science lies. This, this also seems like it's a cluster over here, sort of the political, um, Identity politics, everything is political. Science is political. Oh, hero worship, that's part of this. Um, so that's that's how this is coalescing uh, for me. Now, in the death mm -hmm. farce, we need a good character. So maybe the, maybe the character is someone who's on the front lines, right? You have, I mean, it's a little on the nose, but you could have, you know, wh wh where, if it's not a nurse or a meat packer or something, you know, where could we, or someone in government, What's another location or character where we can see the death farce kind of played out um, in in some way? I mean, it could, it could be a patient, for example. Um, I mean, I quite like the idea of a person who's involved in uh, frontline medical because then you can compromise them. So they're a hero who's being applauded on a nightly basis, but they're having an affair, for example. So you want someone who is, that's part of the joy of farce is um, everyone is compromised in some way, usually. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be an ingenue, um, but usually everybody else is compromised. So I think that actually this is, um, this is kind of, you, you can, what, what I think would be interesting would be to have a hospital. I know this is on the nose, but I, I think, um, this could be, um, but what are we, do, hang on, but what are we doing here? Aren't we just doing topics? Well, we are, but I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm nudging okay. us towards maybe a story kind I'm, of nugget. Uh, Cause it's sort of fun. Okay. Uh, like okay. I'm, I'm I, I just want to make it clear to an audience that you don't have to get a story nugget out of this. That's right. And when I say story nugget, I'm yeah. sort of saying, can we, you know, come up with any of this stuff? Um, I'm just right. feeling, I'm feeling it, man. It's starting to kind of gel in an interesting way. And ooh, I better keep track of time. Um, but, but you could have this contrast between someone working in a hospital and someone working in a meatpacking plant mm -hmm. and how they're similar. 
I mean, that's what I think could be a, mm-hmm. a really interesting, ironic contrast. Um, now, in the hospital, yeah. well, all the it be, far- could it be could it be husband wife? But could it be husband wife married? Well, it, yeah, it could be. And yeah. they're both going. They're both. They're both. Go- I mean, look. If we're going to be on the nose, let's be on the nose. They're married to each other. He works a meatpacking plant. She works as a low end nurse at a hospital. Therefore, doesn't get any protection. And he's also being a hero because without him, you're not getting any meat, but he's not getting it blotted. And she's having an affair, which comes out in the course of this lockdown thing, because obviously you can't get that, that personal space thing. I was, I, and so I mean, here's, here's a heroine who's then got feet of clay. I, I was, I was laughing because I thought of this terrible thing where you have, you know, you, 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 as it's spiraling out of control, you have a timeline where mm. you you know it's coming. Oh, it's arriving. Oh, it's arrived. Oh, it's getting worse. So you have yeah. the day that's like PPE day. The nurse comes into work and they're wearing trash bags. I mean, it's awful, but that's all they have. I mean, they're doing that in some of the hospitals here. So they're putting on rubbish bags, and that and and they're not they're not doing it with any irony it's like this is our ppe right and it's like oh and by yeah. the way here's your mask for two weeks right you have to use the same one for two weeks write your name on it so they write their name on their mask and then they have to wear a trash bag then you go to the meat packer and they the plant says we're putting in new new protections and they just give them like a a flimsy visor and that's it and while the guys are on the line you can look at the guy opposite him who keeps coughing up gooey stuff onto the inside of his of his like plastic protector. <laughs> and eventually he has to lift it up because he can't see what he's doing because he keeps getting fogged up and splattering. And it's like you can just see it coming, right? It's just oh mm-hmm. sorry. That that's what made me laugh is this image. No, no, that's of wonderful. The, that's great. Um the you know, PPE day. And then of course, to make it sort of uh, farce is that every day management tells them that what they see is not what they see. It's always like, you know, this is not what you think, you know, what you see with your own eyes is not what's happening. This is something that the president said last year, I think, which was, I think, so classic. It was like very Kafka-esque. It was like, he said in a rally to his supporters, what you are seeing is not really what's happening. Don't believe your eyes, you know? (laughs) And, Mm -hmm. And I thought that was great. So it's sort of like this situation. It's like, it's getting... You know, we're in a death farce, but let's pretend otherwise. Let's, let's, you know, and um, Hmm. yeah, yeah. So anyway, you were going right to the heart of the emotional conflict between the characters. And and I admire that. I was thinking more of the, just the, the absurdity of the situation that everyone finds himself in, you know, Um, Hmm. how it, it, it's, it's, it brings me back to, I was thinking last night, talking to someone, um, of what it is about stories or about life that that I like to kind of return to. Um, that's sort mm. of my motto um, in general. And I boiled it down to this phrase, you know, I should accept for this because, you know, so many people in sort of authority or in relationships or whatever it may be will say to you, essentially, you should accept for this. And you think, but why, mm. you know, <laughs> Where did we get this perceived wisdom from, and why am I being forced to do something terrible or encouraged, you know, not to think about the, you know, ethical ramifications or whatever it may be? There's a lot of times in life when people are telling you, "Well, you should accept for this," and I think it's always worth asking, "Why? You know, why? Wh- wh- why do I have to accept this?" Mm-hmm. And and it's and I think that in right now in this death farce, there's a lot of propaganda being disseminated to encourage people to do things that are, you know, really awful uh, for themselves and their families. Um, but it's being, the, 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 the terminology is being wrapped in, in a different guise, you know, so, so it makes it more palatable. Um, and I like this too, the sort of, you know the 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 secrets and lies that the the science, the, the the scientists are telling you that like well remember in the beginning that ma- masks were 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 unnecessary, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I thought well I won't write that down. I mean, that's one of those kind of you know 
science is political because essentially what came out later is that they just didn't have enough and they wanted it to go to frontline care workers. And so, right. you know, you could be honest and tell the public that you can say, gosh, you know, masks do help, but unfortunately we're caught with our, with our pants down. We don't have enough of them and we need them to go to frontline workers. So can you not hoard these things? Can you try to find, you know, some happy balance so that we can shunt the majority of them to the mm -hmm. front line? That would have been the honest appraisal, not to have someone go on TV who's a science professional and say, oh, masks are unnecessary. You don't need them. Yeah, you don't need yeah, them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's part of the death farce. Again, it's like, oh, you know, here's this thing that we know, you know, because sensibly, logically, you don't have to ask that question. If you have a disease that is spread by things coming out of people's mouths and going into other people's noses, then something that does mm. this is very clearly a good idea. It doesn't, it's it's going to be good. It doesn't, doesn't take a lot of rocket science to, to determine that fact. So mm. the, the, the notion that we, you know, um, I think actually another interesting, you, you raised this, 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 um, this point. And I think it's really interesting that, 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 Americans, to me, have this notion of, you know, being pioneers. There's this, um, you know, this cultural heritage where they say, you know, we were out on the range, manifest destiny, push west. We took, the, you know, we basically killed a lot of Ameri Native Americans and stuff, and we took the mm -hmm. land, and, and then we brought in slaves to help us build this, this country. But, you know, we were pioneers. That's, that's the message that um, the pioneer spirit is you know John Wayne and all that is what sort of uh, right. people like to think of themselves, but but what I find interesting about that is that to be a pioneer it suggests that you're sort of an iconoclastic thinker or you're sort of out there on your own, you know, uh, being self-sufficient and and tenacious and I think an independent thinker is what I think of you know when I imagine this vision. Uh, hmm. of themselves. Um, and what I find ironic is that I, I sorry, I can't spell independent right now because I'm talking, but <laughs> independent thinker. Right. So, so, so um, what I find interesting is that the, the, the American public is actually really obsequious to authority. Um, whatever the president says, people politely listen, even though he's spouting a lot hmm. of nonsense or lying to people half the time. Then you have people from Wall Street who tell other people how you know the economy runs and you should leave it to the market and all this. So there's a lot of obsequiousness, obsequiousness to authority here. Um, there was a British journalist who said, why is it that when the president enters the room, all the journalists stand up? I mean, that's really odd. I mean, he works for the people, doesn't he? Why are you treating him like a king? So, so the, the point, I think, is that there's this kind of disparity between the American... Um, ideal of the sort of, um, uh, you know, what what people think of themselves here and then the reality. And the reality is that they're very obedient. And so, well, obedient, not in every case, but I'm saying obsequious to authority, obedient to authority. And okay. the people who are not obedient to authority, instead of being sort of reasonable, you know, people, they tend to be white supremacists or something, you know, and so... You yes, have all these kind numbers, of yes. yeah, these sort of private militias, white supremacists going around threatening you know everybody, and that's those are the people that are <laughs> you know, predominantly protesting and complaining, and and hmm. you know kind of reasonable people are are behaving themselves, and um, I think that that's kind of strange because it, we wouldn't have this death farce if it weren't for that behavior. I think you know if people said look, this is stupid. I'm not going to, you know, imagine if in a press briefing, a journalist talked back to the president and said, shut up. I want to hear from the science guy. I don't want to hear about drinking Clorox. Mm. That's, that's nonsense. And people, you know, pushed back and said, you know, stop wasting our time. Um, that would be an assertive behavior that would demand a certain level of competence from leadership. But instead, it's this death farce because everyone's like, oh, we're, you know. And I think that to some degree, this is why we, the U.S. got itself in so much trouble because it, it, it wanted this sort of a federal government patternus to take care of everyone. 
And because right. it didn't, the state governor suddenly said, oh, crap, we're going to have to take charge because otherwise it's going to be a train wreck. And so they have. And people have applauded that and said, isn't it great, this federal system, the governors are really the ones. But it's like, no, it's not great. We should have a really great federal system that can coordinate everybody and do all this logistical stuff that individual states can because we have states bidding against each other on eBay for PPE. I mean, the situation is a farce, right? And it's a farce because we don't demand more from leadership. We just let them kind of do all this crazy stuff and we just roll over. Um, death farce. <laughs> <laughs> I have talked. Uh, I have talked uh, your ear off, chewed your ear off at this, and uh, you got me going. Um, from that nice Good. little initial uh, science is political. I I have to mm. run to another um, meeting, but okay. I think that's good. We you know I took up uh, well, well over an hour well of your time. So so I uh, thank you. No, you did the problem. I, um, and I've got some more. So I have some more topics saved up for next time. So oh awesome. Hopefully, I, see you next week. So I want to work on. I want to work on the death force. I had another. Death idea okay. that um that i mean i didn't even bring okay i won't bring it up there's something else that could open up in a whole other direction but we'll come back to that another time thank okay. you toby okay my Talk pleasure thank you sir have a good week bye